Today is a special episode. We are joined by Jacob Shapiro, a geopolitical analyst who wears many, many hats. He's the director <laughs> of geopolitical analysis at Cognitive Investments, the geopolitics editor at Lycaon, and the chief strategist at Perch Perspectives. Jacob, welcome to Forward Guidance. Thanks, Jack. Uh, you're heroic for being here. I know that you're <laughs> feeling a little under the weather. Yeah, so I, I do have strep throat, uh, but I'm on the tail end of it. And, you know, today's kind of an emergency episode. It needed to happen, Jacob, just because of what is going on in Ukraine. Jacob, you know, rather than me sort of stuttering through what I've read uh, over the past week and then sort of you making sense of it, how about you, you just tell us what is going on in Ukraine and, and specifically what has gone over the past 48 hours? Yeah, well, I'll try to keep it very succinct because there's a lot that's going on, obviously. But the highlights are that yesterday, so today's Tuesday, on, on Monday or Sunday, Monday, depending on how you time it, um, Russian President Vladimir Putin uh, gave an extremely strident speech. It's maybe the angriest I've ever seen Putin say anything. He's actually usually somewhat funny and, and somewhat optimistic, if you can imagine that. He was not so this time. Um, and he decided that he was going to recognize the independence of Luhansk and Donetsk. Um, th that also requires a little bit of explanation. So in 2014, when Ukraine had its revolution, there were separatist rebels who wanted to break off from Ukraine in these provinces. They don't control the entire province. They control roughly about half of it if you look at a map. And Russia just said, OK, we're recognizing their independence. Now, that's important for two reasons. All of the negotiations that have been happening since 2014 out the window. Forget about them. The moment Russia decided to recognize them, that whole structure goes away. And basically, Russia and Europe and the United States are starting from scratch when it comes to negotiations. The second interesting thing is, what does it mean to recognize their independence? Are they recognizing just where the separatists control territory, which is not the full province kind of boundaries of those two areas? Or is it the entire provinces? Because if it's both of the provinces, then the Russian peacekeepers, soldiers, little green men, whatever you want to call them, who have poured over into the borders, uh, they're going to expand and we might have an actual confrontation and suddenly we're talking about war. This morning, we're recording on Tuesday, the Russian foreign ministry said, no, it's just the areas where the separatists are in control. Uh, we have no reason to believe anything the Russians say at this point, if I'm being frank. So who knows if that actually means anything. But the Russians, at least today on Tuesday morning, are saying, no, we're just recognizing these hived off portions where the separatists are in control. And we're ready to negotiate with the Europeans and the Americans whenever you guys want to chat. So that's kind of where we are today. I guess the last thing we should say about where we are today is the West is lining up its sanctions responses, and some of them have been more impressive than others. We're still kind of waiting on the exact color of the U.S. sanctions, um, but there have been leaks from officials that maybe the U.S. isn't going to view this as the huge invasion that would trigger the really crippling sanctions. Uh, Germany suspended the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. That's a big deal. That's about as strong as it gets. The UK was very, very loud and brash about how angry they were. Their actual san sanctions were tepid. A couple oligarchs here, a couple banks here, none of the big boys, etc. My old prediction was 70-30 scenario, 70% 70 probability of no Russian invasion, 30% probability of invasion. Within those scenarios, I had some wiggle room. So I was I was 40% diplomatic resolution, 30% uh, Russia's just going to take these small areas in Donetsk and Luhansk. And then my 30% invasion was going to be either, okay, they're going to take eastern Ukraine or they're going to take the whole country. That that was kind of my old framework for, for with what I was working with. Um, to be honest with you, I don't have new probabilities yet in my head. I'm still trying to wrap my head around everything that's happened in the last 24 to 48 hours. Obviously, my 40% political resolution, well, not obviously, there actually could still be a political resolution, but that looks a lot less likely. I think we're still in the no invasion scenario. It's that sort of they're going to seize Donetsk and Luhansk and try and, and use a political um, uh, try and gain political concessions, but the chances of an invasion are definitely much higher than they were before. And like I said, the key things I think to watch going forward are how is the West going to respond? How is Ukraine going to resist? Is the Ukrainian army going to actually set up and try to defend portions of Western Ukraine or Eastern Ukraine, or are they just going to roll over? Um, how much force is Russia actually going to be able to deploy and how long are they going to be able to keep the deployments? Those are some of the variables I'll be watching for going forward. I think my, my key takeaway is 
I still think this is about politics. I still think that Russia is angling for some kind of political resolution. And I think that even though tactically they are threatening war, they're using the threat of war to get the political concessions that they want. Um, but the odds of, of me being wrong definitely went up significantly from that 70-30 scenario that I was describing before. So, I mean, make it 60-40, make it 55-45. I mean, it's, it's kind of somewhere in that range. And I should also say, I mean, 70-30 sounds like pretty good odds. 30% um, chance of a Russia-Ukraine war for such a cataclysmic event is actually a fairly large number. Um, this is one of the reasons, like, you know, in, in analysis, like if we're thinking about nuclear war, the chances of nuclear war are probably one in 200 million, right? But the one in 200 million means the absolute destruction and annihilation of the earth. So even though we spend, we don't think it's very likely, uh, we have to spend a lot of time thinking about it. A 30% chance of a Ukraine-Russia war from somebody like me, that's actually a fairly high probability. Um, and the fact that I'm now having to move that 60 40 55 45 depending how you're thinking about it um, that's a big deal especially considering how bad it is so so that's where i'm at i'm still sticking to my guns but i'm certainly less confident than i was before but if if i'm right that's also exactly what putin wants so so you can look at that as maybe they're leaving themselves more room if things escalate further so they don't have to go straight to military action you can also view it as the west just continues to be weenies about this whole thing and putin thinks he can take whatever he wants and maybe he will um, so that's kind of where we stand right now yeah and this could have big economic and financial implications because even though ukraine you know it's a very fertile region it, it's not a economic powerhouse by any means however the sanctions that the west the, the U, uh, nato the uk and particularly the us could impose on russia those could be crippling for russia and perhaps europe as well uh can you just paint a picture for us as to the the high stakes of what those sanctions could look like and um, you know perhaps how they would impact both russia and uh the and europe because when you impose sanctions on a particular country it's sort of like economic violence right when we pose sanctions on venezuela but in this case it could also impose significant damage to the european economy right absolutely and, and there's a bunch of things to kind of pick apart there uh, the first is that you're right that ukraine is not an economic powerhouse however Russia and Ukraine are two of the largest wheat exporters in the world. And we're already in a situation where food prices are higher than they've been since the last spike around 2008, you know, 2011 kind of zone. So if suddenly Ukrainian wheat is not making to market because of whatever, whether it's being blocked out through the Black Sea because there's a war going on, you know, whatever else, we're going to see that show up in food prices. You're going to see that show up in global inflation, et cetera. So it's not, it's not like there's nothing there to worry about. In terms of sanctions, um, I'll quote for you. Uh, what the Russian ambassador to Sweden said last week when asked about sanctions. And apologies to listeners who have delicate ears, but I'm quoting here. He said, literally, we don't give a shit about sanctions. Like that's a, that's a direct quote. Some of that is fronting. Like some of that is Russia trying to say that this is not that big of a deal. But sanctions, it really, it really depends how fierce the sanctions are. So there have been sanctions from the West on Russia and Russian oligarchs and Russian institutions back since 2014. They have been largely weak. Um, and in some ways, they've actually furthered Putin's aims because one of the things Russia absolutely has to do is diversify its economy and try and make sure that it's self-sufficient in lots of different areas. Those sanctions allowed Putin to do that on some level, some domestic economic measures that might have been quite onerous in a normal market environment. Suddenly, Putin could just say, hey, hey, the, the West, this is the West's fault. I'm not doing this. You guys have to figure something else out because the evil West is coming after us. Now, there's a line, though, past which sanctions can become crippling. Because even though Russia has de-dollarized and even though Russia has become a little more self-sufficient and even though they've diversified their economy a little bit, um, we're still living in a dollar world. The dollar is still the reserve currency. It's still going to be very difficult for Russia to do things if, for instance, the United States says, no, we're cutting you off from SWIFT. Or no, we're going to sanction everybody that imports Russian oil the same way we do with Iran right now. If the U.S. and the West want to go to you know pariah level North Korea, Iran sanctions on Russia, it's a cataclysmic problem for the Russian economy. And I don't know how long it can last. Maybe for a little while, they've built up their national reserves. Uh, and, and that's kind of what I'm watching for right now. If Putin really thinks the West isn't going to do anything that bad, if the best they've got is some oligarchs and some sanctions on banks, but they're not going to go after the swift payment processing systems, they're not going to make it impossible for Russia to sell oil abroad, 
then whatever. Then he can decide to do whatever he wants to do. But if the West is really, you know, if, if I was advising, say, Macron or Scholz or Biden, I would say like, hey, you need to call him right now and say we're for real. And here's all the things we're going to do. OK, and, and then de-dollarization and SWIFT. SWIFT is the payment rails, sort of how, right, how things are sort of uh, s trade is settled internationally. Tell us about that, uh, how the U.S. would take that away, and then also the role of, of de-dollarization. We've never really kind of been in this before, but it's all about sanctioning folks that are taking payments from Russia. So if, if you make Russia a pariah state, if you're going to enforce sanctions on anybody that does business with Russia the same way that the U.S. has done with Iran and North Korea, suddenly nobody's going to want to do business with Russia. And to the extent that they will, it's going to be countries that are either not afraid of the United States or that need the things that Russia um, exports more than um, they're afraid of the types of sanctions that the U.S. can impose. Um, in terms of de-dollarization, I mean, it's it's kind of a complicated picture because um, Russia has absolutely reduced its dependence on the dollar. Uh, it's gotten dollar assets out of its national wealth fund. It has increasingly, um, you know, in terms of settlement of its exports, that's increasingly less n in dollars. So I think it was something like 80% seven or eight years ago. It's down to about 50%, 40% or something like that. But the problem with that is it's it's it basically substituted dollars for euros. And dollars and euros are all part of the same strategic environment. Even their friends, the, the Chinese, who they say they're so close with, uh, when China exports to Russia, they expect to be paid in dollars. More than 50% they expect to be paid in dollars. The only country, if you look at Russia's um, statistics, that seems to be the only country outside, I should say, of kind of the old Soviet bloc, that is taking Russian rubles to a fairly significant degree is India. So in that sense, um, you know, if Putin really wants to go full invasion here and wants to risk sanctions on from the dollar and from the euro and the inability for Russia to to exist in a euro dollar system, uh, it's it's a pretty scary picture, I would think, for Russia long term, even medium term. So some of our, our viewers, Jacob, might be familiar with the fact that you know the dollar is the global reserve currency and that if foreign countries have debts that are denominated in dollars, you can have this, you can rapidly spiral out of control because they have to print more of their domestic currency to pay off uh, a foreign currency. That's sort of like you know high finance. But in the world of geopolitics, what does the fact that we have a dollar, a global dollar reserve, and that, that the dollar is the global reserve asset, what does that actually mean in terms of things that uh, U.S. officials can do. They can make some phone calls that, uh, that say, you know, uh, uh, the president of Turkey, or officials at Turkey can't make. What, what does that mean in terms of the power dynamics? And what would that, if the U.S. were to exert swift and, you know, uh, vigorous, vicious domestic, uh, diplomatic action, like what could they just say, no trade? And, and how, how do they do that? You know, how could they stop goods flowing across the border? What would the enforcement mechanisms look like? Yeah, it's a great question. And enforcement is not perfect. But the best example we have for this is, is Iran. Um, and what the U.S. did with with Iran was it said anybody and it, it constantly has to add Iranian institutions to its list because the Iranians are constantly trying to get out from underneath the sanctions and they have shell companies that, you know, if you don't if you're not on this list, then you can kind of do it. So, you know, the United States is constantly adding new people, new Iranian institutions to sanction lists to get rid of all those loopholes. I think you're also right from a geopolitical perspective. I think it's useful to think of trade. Um, the metaphor I always use is water. You can dam water, you can move a river in certain directions, but water will find the cracks. It will get through the cracks, it will eventually go where it needs to go. And over a long time period, it'll carve the Grand Canyon into mountains. So like you can try and stop trade, you can move it in different directions, but ultimately trade's gonna go where trade is gonna go because people import and export the things that they have and that's kind of the way it is. But if you make it sufficiently difficult for people to do that, or you increase the pain point for other nations to do that, you can affect things in a really material way. And I bring up the example of Iran because Iran pre kind of the US sanctions um, imposition kind of mid 2000s um, was, you know, exporting three, uh, not export, I should say was producing 3 million, 4 million barrels of oil a day um, was, was uh, exporting half of that. Uh, their production dropped below 2 million barrels per day after sanctions and exporting even less. And to, we don't even know if those exports are real because we're kind of trusting shadowy figures. Is China getting around them? Is India getting waivers around them, et cetera? Um, so that's what you can do. You can make it harder for countries to interact with 
a country like Iran, like Russia, you can increase the cost of dealing with those countries. You can have the threat of if you're dealing with them, we're going to sanction you as well. And that's also going to affect you. It's about making things as hard as possible. You can't shut them off completely. Um, but if we use the Iran example, sure, if, if you could cut Russia's oil exports by half, I mean, that's going to reverberate throughout the Russian economy. You're going to see shortages and all kinds of really negative things happening in the Russian economy in three to six months if you're able to to take half of their exports off by pressuring your allies. So that's how it works. It's never going to be perfect, but it's all about increasing cost, increasing inconvenience. You, you said uh, shortages, Jacob, in, in the Russian economy. Wouldn't the only shortages would be financial? And obviously, you know, the financial world interacts with the real economic world uh, a great degree. But wouldn't the real shortages be in Europe? Because in your piece uh, uh, written earlier this month on Lycan, you noted that something around 47 percent of the Euro Europe's uh, natural gas imports come from Russia. So it, you know, and, and it, you, maybe you can talk about how Russia is a pretty self-sufficient place. It grows its own wheat. It grows its own natural gas. It's not like the United States where we just import everything. Um, so when you know Europe would have some pain as well, and also wouldn't these sanctions wouldn't they require compliance from Germany, from France, from the UK in order to uh, enact them? Like it's, it's, the US can't just press a button, right? They have to have. Uh, you know, you know a European countries on board to not accept uh, uh, Russian goods, right? I'd push back a little bit. You're wrong about the United States. I mean, yes, the United States imports a lot, but the United States is way more self-sufficient than Russia could ever hope to be. Uh, the United oh, okay. States is an agricultural superpower. It's an energy superpower. Um, yes, there are some parts of tech supply chains that have been outsourced in the United States, but a lot of the cutting edge research, a lot of the design, that's all still here. Um, the United States can handle um, a more protectionist world a lot better than Russia can. You're right that Russia has a lot of energy. You're right that they're able to grow a lot of wheat. But outside of that, I mean, Russia's mostly, it's mostly exporting commodities. When I say that Putin has to improve the Russian economy, part of what I'm saying there is that you don't have big Russian tech companies. You don't have Russian semiconductor companies. You don't have Russian companies that make the things that power the modern economy. And they're trying to get into that. They're trying to diversify, but they've only been trying for seven to eight years. And they've been trying in a general market where oil prices were very low. So they were really building up reserves rather than necessarily investing in innovation. But you hit the nail on the head in terms of it, when you said that, yes, when I'm talking about shortages in Russia, I'm not talking about shortages of things like natural gas and oil. I'm talking about budget shortfalls. I'm talking about Moscow not being able to support all of those areas. Look at a, a map of Russia. It's a huge country. And Moscow is usually um, providing the budget for all of the social services and all of the subsidies and all the things that keep the you know over 100 million plus Russians um, living their day to day lives. Europe, incredibly dependent on Russian energy. Uh, it's, as you said, it's something like over 40% of European natural gas comes from Russia. Something like a quarter of European oil comes from Russia. Um, and that's why Europe has been so hesitant to really take a strong approach towards Russia, because in the short term, there's no real way to replace that dependence on Russia. In the medium to long term, Europe's basically already decided it can't depend on Russia. And you see that with the massive investments they're making in things like hydrogen, LNG, even fracking in some parts of Eastern Europe, um, you know, solar, wind. I mean, the reason that the EU is going, at, the EU will tell you the reason they're going after renewables and green energy is because they want to save the planet, whatever. It's really because they don't want to import energy from Russia anymore. There's a real geopolitical strategic imperative there. And uh, this is one of the ironic things. The, the more Putin pushes like this, the more aggressive he is, the more he lives up to the stereotype of sort of the evil Russian leader who wants to invade the rest of Europe, uh, the more the Europeans are just going to say, hey, we really do need to get off of this Russian energy. We really need to invest in renewables. We really need to diversify. We really need to think in different terms about our, our energy matrix. So there'll be short term pain for Europe for sure if we get to an invasion and Russian energy supplies are cut off. Um, the U.S. has said it's going to help Europe make up for the, the natural gas shortages and oil sh um, shortages that would come in a full scale war. They can't. They can maybe do 15 percent of it, you know, but there's still going to be shortages and prices are still going to shoot up. But long term, ironically, by doing what he's done, um, Putin in some ways has is losing his best customer when it comes to where Russia exports its natural gas and its oil right now. Right. Jacob, you said to me earlier that if Russia does invade Ukraine, and we can talk about what invading Ukraine means. I think you actually mean tanks rolling through Kiev. 
uh, then if Russia does invade Ukraine, oil could go very, very high. And you, you listed a number of $300 a barrel. That, that's not your prediction, but you listed that as just something sort of a very high number. Uh, what, what would that, how would that impact the global economy and specifically Europe? And, and might that, as you say, reduce Europe's willingness to impose these sanctions? I mean, I, I know that Germany just canceled or announced that it was halting, and you can talk about this, Nord Stream 2, which is this big planned pipeline for natural gas. Um, I mean, would there ever be a situation where Nord Stream 1 would be canceled? Or I mean, I know that's already been built, but, you know? Yeah, I mean, I mean, Nord Stream 2 has been built. They've just been waiting on approval so that they can start um, pumping natural gas through. And Nord Stream 2 was to get around Ukraine. So that the idea is that, you know, set up a scenario where Russia can deal with Ukraine and you don't have to worry about cutting off supplies or they don't have to be hostage to the Ukrainians doing things. Uh, look, and yes, you're right. If, if there's a full-scale war, and you're right that for me, well, it, it's not just tanks rolling towards Kiev. If, if, we get, if we get Russia moving past the current areas in Donetsk and Luhansk that are under separatist control, we're in Ukraine invasion scenario. And we can talk about, you know, whether it's just the eastern portion, whether it's the whole portion, like at that point, we're kind of splitting hairs. We're in the invasion scenario at that point. And my, um, you know, sort of probabilistic uh, prediction that I didn't think Russia was going to go full on would kind of break. Um, in its face. And yes, if you get that, I think you'll see energy prices surge. Um, I think you are, however, seeing the limits and the constraints on European and American power in Ukraine, just by virtue of the fact that you're not seeing European and American forces deploy to Western Ukraine. You're actually seeing all the diplomatic personnel leave. Um, you know, to, if, if Russia decides to go after Ukraine, there's not going to be military support from the West. It's going to be mostly economic support. And then the West is going to get really hard and really strong in those NATO ally states, which goes to your point, like, yes, maybe they will continue to import at least some level of Russian energy because the alternative is literally cataclysmic. Um, but again, this is also why I think that it'd be really hard to imagine Putin doing this, because if he goes hard after Ukraine and if you get that kind of price spike, sure, it might line Russia's pockets for a while. But as I said, long term, you're basically ensuring an adversarial relationship with Europe, which whatever Russia wants to say about it being a Eurasian power, Russia's a European power. And if everybody in Europe is going to shun you and is going to make it a national strategic priority to not be dependent on you anymore, it may take a couple of years and it's going to really suck for the Ukrainians. But long term, that's a defeat for Putin and it's a defeat for Russia. They cannot win if they go hard. If there's any silver lining to this, maybe for your listeners, I really do think that if I'm wrong about Russia, and if they really are trying to invade, and they're going to go all the way to Kiev, it's going to suck for the Ukrainians and my thoughts and feelings with all my Ukrainian friends out there. I, I feel bad for them. In the long term, though, it's a loss for Russia. As Americans, we all know what it's like to engage in land wars far across our borders and what that looks like in terms of what it does to your country, your national cohesion, your budgets, all these other things. And Russia's far less powerful and far less wealthy than the United States is. So what are the strategic imperatives of Russia of doing this? What is going through Putin's head? What do you think he wants? What does uh, the Kremlin, what does, what, what does Moscow want out of this? And, and do you think that they recognize that calculus that you just laid out? Or do you think that they actually, they see benefit in steamrolling Kiev? That's a difficult question. I'll, I'll try to answer it in a couple different ways. Uh, the first is that Russia is obviously not a monolith. Putin has opinions of his own, but we've also seen, and some of this is for public consumption because Putin wants to make Russia seem more open and democratic than it actually is. Uh, but his foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, has been saying, no, let's do negotiations. We're not ready for a military solution yet. Um, in his speech, before he announced that he was recognizing Donetsk and Luhansk, there was an intelligence official who said that it shouldn't be recognizing independence, that Russia should annex them. And Putin interrupted the guy and said, no, 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 we're, we're, we're not annexing. We're just recognizing independence here. Calm down. So the Russian establishment is not of one view here. In terms of Putin himself, I don't know the man. I, I couldn't tell you what he had for breakfast or whether he actually likes dolphins or whether those are just PR maneuvers. Who knows? So I can't actually offer you any unique insight on Putin as a man. What I can tell you is that Russia for hundreds of years has had certain strategic priorities that every single Russian leader from Putin all the way back to Vlad the Impaler has had to deal with. Um, I actually, I wrote a piece a little while ago because I wanted to find 
um, if there was a, an attempted invasion of Russia every century for the past four centuries. And there has been. The Nazis almost took Russia. If, if Hitler hadn't gotten distracted and Japan hadn't done some crazy stuff, probably the Nazis take over Moscow and it's really bad. Uh, in the 19th century, it was Napoleon. He got all the way to Moscow. He had to leave because the Russian winter beat him. But he got there. He conquered it. He burned the city. Uh, this was the really special one. The century before that, it was the Swedes. Sweden invaded Russia and almost got all the way to Moscow. And then you go another century back into the 1600s and you get the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, which again, makes it all the way to Moscow, burns the city, occupies it for a few years. I'm saying all that to say um, that Russia's propaganda about its paranoia about security concerns, it absolutely is propaganda, but there's a kernel of truth to it. And the truth is Russia feels really insecure. And if you look back at its history, it has reason to feel really insecure. Until the rise of the Soviet Union, it was usually the West that was invading Russia, not Russia kind of invading the opposite direction. Why is it that the West was invading Russia rather than the other way around? What, what, is it something geographical? Is it, is it just the, the you know, the, just more people in the West because it's more fertile? What, what's... Yeah, it's, it's primarily geographic. So if you look at a map of the Northern European plain, you can basically drive tanks from Paris all the way to Moscow without meeting a natural boundary. And as you get closer to Moscow, it widens. So the, the sort of the narrower the Northern European plain is, the more you can at least try and defend it, even though it's flat ter territory. But once you get past Ukraine, the Northern European plain really opens wide up and it's hard for Russia to defend. So that means Russia just has to continue pushing out as far as it can. And one of the reasons Ukraine is such an important piece of Russian national security is because if you can take all of Ukraine, you get to the Carpathian Mountains and you at least shrink the Northern European plain to an extent that you can defend it a little bit better than you would otherwise. So I think that's the the strategic priority there. The other part of this, um, and this is something that um, Dario Fabri reminded me, he's an Italian analyst who was on my podcast just last week. Um, you know, it's not just the, there's the geography, but there's also the, the demography of the area. Because, you know, Russia's a country, I forget what the exact population is, maybe 150 million people, I'm guessing. It's always been a large country. It's always been a large territory. It has some really agriculturally fertile regions. It has a lot of potential labor and things like that. And Germany, especially in the late 1800s, early 1900s, looked at Russia as a potential colony. Um, uh, uh, Otto von Bismarck described Russia as Germany's Africa. So they were thinking of Russia as a place where they could expand their colonial interests, where they could relocate some of their supply chains, where they can harvest raw materials and use cheap labor to grow the German economy, that hasn't actually changed. Germany still thinks like that. They still want to extend their supply chains out there. They still want to sell their products to Russians. They still think of Russia in those terms. So it's it's geographic and it's demographic are the primary reasons that Russia's had that threat for so long. What When you say that, what do you mean and what would it look like? Yeah, we're, we're far too woke for old old style colonialism. Like that's not going to happen anymore. But we're, we're already living through a new era of imperialism. And it doesn't have to be violent. It doesn't have to. It also doesn't have to be bad for everyone. The model for this is how Germany's dealt with Eastern Europe. When the Soviet Union fell and the Eastern European countries got integrated into the EU, they also got integrated into the German supply chain. And so what happened was German companies saw that there was really well-educated, really willing, really cheap labor in places like Poland and the Czech Republic and Hungary and Romania. And they outsourced a lot of their supply chains and a lot of their production to those, um, to those countries. That's a large part of the reason why Germany had a quote-unquote economic miracle post-2000. Uh, if you look at old editions of The Economist, like late 90s, early 2000s, they were calling Germany the sick man of the euro. And they were talking about, oh, Germany's going to be you know, dealing with the cost of reintegrating East Germany back into the country for decades. It took them like five or six years. And the reason it did that was because East Germany and all of these Eastern European states had all of this cheap labor that could make German products more cheaply and had all of this pent up demand for German products. And it just kind of worked. So Germany, in terms of its policy, um, it thinks in economic terms and it wants to expand into the Balkans for that region because that's another place where you can replicate that. And Russia is another place where you can can replicate that that um, that sort of economic strategy. I was sort of exaggerating for effect when I talked about Germany's colonial attitude towards Russia. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. But, but like I said, th there's a real part of it. Like Russia, uh, Germany has viewed Russia 
since the fall of the Soviet Union as a massive economic opportunity. And one of the things that Germ one of the reasons Germany has been so hesitant to go really hard at Russia with sanctions is because it's holding on hope that it can still do that, that, that it's going to still continue to expand and integrate Russia into the European economy, which Russia doesn't want. R Russia would rather be poor um, and self-sufficient and independent than part of Europe and not have its st strategic self-reliance. And probably some of your listeners can relate to that. How important is this economically, you know, or is it really just about sort of uh, geopolitics and and like power grabs? I don't think we can separate the geopolitics from the economics. And there's the old Clausewitz quote that everybody you know invokes that you know war is just politics by by other means. Um, I think that's actually I think you actually raise a good point, and it's it's maybe something I should have said earlier, which is um, geopolitics as a word gets thrown around an awful lot these days. Um, I see it, you know, in the Wall Street Journal, it feels like almost every other day now. And it's mostly used as just a synonym for international relations or for great power conflict. That's really not what geopolitics is. Geopolitics is a methodology for understanding the behavior of states. Um, and it treats states, uh, I'm, I'm crudely simplifying here, but it basically treats states as if they were organisms. And so if you think of an organism, it, we have different parts of our bodies. We have different needs. We need to breathe oxygen. We need to eat food. We need to feel secure. We need to ha build a shelter. Um, think of that on a national level. So yes, you have to ensure supply of food. You have to make sure you can defend from potential attack, all these sorts of things. Um, so you can't really... Um, disconnect, I think, economics from geopolitics. It's absolutely part of it. And in times where the world is largely peaceful, as we've had for the last 30 years or so, when the United States was the dominant power and no one was able, like U.S. power was so far ahead of everyone else that nobody else was really challenging the U.S., you had the sort of period where economics was the driving factor in global affairs, much more so than political concerns or security concerns. If you'd been looking through just a geopolitical lens for the past 30 years, you would have gotten everything wrong. You would have missed globalization, you would have missed the rise of China, and you would have missed all the things that have happened in global agricultural trade. Um, all that happened because economics was allowed to basically do whatever it wanted in an environment that was more unipolar and more peaceful. So I will say what's happening now, and this is kind of where Ukraine is not just, it's not just an exception. This is happening all around the world. We can talk about conflicts that are happening all around the world and they're all interconnected because we're moving away from globalization. We're moving away from this moment where there was one power that everybody kind of recognized that that was the dominant power to where we've got a bunch of powers that all want their own sphere of influence, that all want to have their own self-sufficiency, that are all looking at the world and saying, you know what? Security matters more to me than efficiency. Redundancy matters more to me than just-in-time supply chains. Uh, I want to be able to have my own monetary policy, even if that means inflation, even if that means bad things, so that down the line, I can control my currency because in the current global environment, that's very hard to do. So in that sense, um, I don't think there's any huge, you know, energy is obviously a huge thing and, and wheat is obviously a huge thing when we get to the actual um, financial implications of a, of a Ukraine-Russia crisis. But the broader thing that we're talking about here is the move away from globalization to regionalization, the move away from unipolarity to multipolarity, and the real arrival or rearrival of geopolitics in the world where it's largely been dormant for the past 30 years. You said countries want to be in control of their own monetary policy. I couldn't help but think of the euro where, you know, before the, the euro, uh, Greece could print as many drachmas as it wanted and it would have inflation and currency depreciation, but it, at least it would not go go bankrupt and have to you know force austerity on so many people. But now that it's part of the Europe, uh, part of the euro, it, uh, you know, it's the European Central Bank that uh, controls the euro and not the, you know, the Greek central bank controlling the drachma. Uh, what about the countries in the Balkans and, and in like Lithuania and Latvia? I know that they are in Estonia. They are in NATO, which essentially is you know, run by the U.S. and it was a bulwark against the uh, Soviet Union. And we can get into like what is the role of NATO in a post-Soviet Union world. Uh, are they also in the euro? And you know, do they use the euro currency? And if not, what are, what are the sort of the, the currency implications there? Uh, yeah, I mean, we could do a whole episode just on NATO if you want. Um, some countries do and some countries don't have the euro. But um, the euro is actually a really interesting case because a lot of these European countries, uh, yes, they have ceded control 
over their monetary policy to the EU. That comes with benefits, though, because that means you get to be part of this big free trade bloc. It means that German factories do get built in your territory and provide lots of jobs and lots of wages and things like that. It also means that on the global scale, you can punch way above your weight. Now, that that's not a great consolation for Greeks who saw their pensions blow up in their faces or for Southern Italians for whom it really doesn't make sense that Southern Italians and Greeks have the same currency as folks in sort of the industrial heartland or the financial capitals of Amsterdam, Paris, Berlin. Like there's a real disconnect there. And you can see that in how the EU has struggled to maintain cohesion over time. But the flip side of that is people take Greece way more seriously as a member of the EU than they would otherwise. They take Italy even way more seriously as a member of the EU than they would otherwise. Even Germany and France. Germany and France, it's we're not living in the 1800s right now. They don't get to be global powers just on their own. They have to pool their resources in order to be taken seriously on the global scale. That's why the euro is so interesting. There's this push and pull. Internally, the Europeans are divided and they have all of their national identities, but at the global level, they have to be together if they want to be able to throw their weight around. Um, so we can talk about the euro more, but that's kind of how I see the euro. In terms of countries you know, taking control over their monetary policy, though, this goes back to what we were talking about with the dollar. It, it really explains why Russia is trying to get away from the dollar and why it's increasing reserves of yuan and gold. It helps explain why um, Erdogan is doing what he's doing in Turkey. He's not crazy. He might be wrong. It might all blow up in his face, but he's not crazy. It's clear what he's doing. Um, in general, you're seeing countries that are, are trying to at least have some control so that when the Fed raises interest rates, they're not just beholden to the Fed and they have to worry about the whole system kind of going up. Mm. And let's say, talk about President Zelensky. He, he had a, uh, the president of Ukraine. He, he had a very interesting rise in Ukraine. I believe he was on a TV show where he was played a character who was running for president. And then he ran for president. A, a very, you know, quite a unique story. What's going on with him? I believe when he first was elected, he was a lot more friendly with Rush, Russia than he was now. What happened? Sort of, how did the West win his allegiance? And what is... Uh, going in terms of geo, you know, what what are the uh, pros and cons of, of siding with the West versus siding with Russia? What does Putin offer, and what does the West offer? You got to feel for Zelensky. I mean, he went from being a comedian to being the president of Ukraine, and probably its biggest crisis. Uh, I mean, certainly in this century, uh, you know, we're talking World War II level existential national security crises for Ukraine. Um, he doesn't have a lot of good choices. He would love. And most of Western, he represents Western Ukraine in this point of view, which has been getting further and further away from Russia. He would love to be part of NATO and he would love to be part of the EU. And he would love to have all of those sweet, sweet euros and dollars kind of filling up his economy and things like that. The West isn't interested because the West doesn't want to go to war with Russia over Ukraine. Ukraine matters way more to Russia than it does for the rest of Europe. As I said, for Russia, they need to get to the Carpathians. You want to get to the Carpathians, you got to hold Ukraine. The, the Europeans, that's fine. They can just chill behind the Carpathians right now. The only thing you get if you're going to go past there and you're going to start integrating some of these other areas, you better be willing to go all the way to Moscow. And none of them want that. They want an economic relationship and a political relationship with Russia. They don't want to conquer Russia, which Moscow can't get through its head because of its strategic history and the way that it thinks about geopolitics, unfortunately. That's why we're kind of in this current situation right now. I wish I, wish I could wave a magic wand and just kind of make those fears and suspicions go away, but you can't. But when we're thinking about Zelensky, it's clear why he wants to go to the West. And his strategy might work if he had a West that was willing to engage with him, but they're not really. They're willing to applaud for him at the Munich Security Conference. They're willing to give him some anti-tank weapons. They're willing to maybe give him some financial aid and stuff like that. But nobody's going to come defend Kiev if it really comes to that. And so that puts him in a really difficult situation. And that might be what Russia's really driving at. If we look back at what Russia did in 2008, um, it did. It's it was sort of this exact playbook. Recognize some sep yeah, it re recognize some separatist regions. Put Russian peacekeepers, soldiers in those regions. Don't conquer Georgia. Just let Georgia know you can conquer Georgia if you want to, and show Georgia that the West isn't coming. They're not going to save your butts like they promised you behind closed doors. When it comes down to it, they're not going to be there for you. And 
you know, that's where George's existed. And maybe Russia is thinking, okay, we're going to embarrass Zelensky and we're going to get a more pragmatic. I don't think they can hope for a pro-Russian government in Kiev, but maybe they can hope for one that's more pragmatic, one that recognizes, hey, the West isn't there for us either. Let's be neutral. Let's, let's go for Switzerland, because if we're Switzerland, we get the relationship with Russia. Maybe we get some of the relationship with the West. We can play both sides off of each other. It's uncomfortable, but but at least that's sustainable and we have some of our independence. That might be the political solution that Putin is driving for. If I'm still right about Russia's calculus on an invasion, that's what this is all about. Embarrass Zelensky to the point that he's not going to be able to stay in power and get somebody in Kiev who the Russians feel like they can actually work with, manipulate, whatever word you want to use there. Okay, we're, we're really getting getting to the crux of the issue. So Georgia, uh, not the U.S. state of Georgia, but the country of Georgia, where, where uh, um, Joseph Stalin was actually from, if, if uh, NATO floated the idea of Georgia joining NATO in 2008, maybe it was before then, and then Russia, as you said, uh, invaded, took over 20% of the country, then that's essentially what, what's happening now. So you think that that is that the most likely scenario in terms of uh, an end game, a word which I know you loathe, and perhaps we can get into why you loathe the word end game. Everyone's always looking for an end game, but there. Um, and and also, when is Zelensky's term up? When is when is the next election, or is it sort of like he's so unpopular that he'll just go out? I don't think he's unpopular now, and he, he's got some time. But you know, you can have a a government can fall for a lot of different reasons. It's not going to stay there. I don't hate the word end game. I'm I'm a chess player. The end game is the fun part. <laughs> oh, me too. I, I I will say that. Um, there are two types of geopolitical analysts, um, and this if, if your listeners haven't read Philip Tetlock, um, he's a great person to, to read because he did this study of political forecasters trying to figure out which political forecasters were right and which were wrong. And he ironically found that the ones that were right were the ones that changed their minds the most, and that made them often less charismatic. So they would go on a show like yours and they would be like, well, I think this, but it could be this and maybe this. And if you ask me tomorrow, it's going to be completely different. That's not what people want to yeah. hear. People want people like me to come on and say, Russia is going to invade Ukraine tomorrow at yeah. 3 p.m. Right, you know, put it in there. And even if they're wrong, you know, the, they, they like that. They like feeling that kind of certainty. They like pe people who come on with a tie who work at a think tank and come in and say, Putin has a dark heart. Yeah, no, but cause, because they, <laughs> they don't have democracy. time. Yeah. They, they don't have time to, to delve into the nuances. They just want to know what's happening and, they, and then get back to whatever it is they're doing. They want to get back to their lives. So I get it. Um, so I, I tell you that story because uh, the the sort of one trick ponies, if you will, are Tedlock calls them hedgehogs. That's they have one idea, they apply it to everything. It's always the same. It's going to be charismatic, and you're going to feel good after you listen to it. Might not. It's probably not going to be right, but at least it's going to be compelling. And then foxes are the other ones who are kind of constantly contradicting. Mm, oh themselves. yeah, yeah. I'm I'm a fox. So when I say that I'm a fox, that means that I get uncomfortable about making grand pronouncements because I don't have a crystal ball. What I have is a is a method for understanding how nations are going to behave. And this is the second point I want to make. Um, the worst enemy of intelligence and anal of analysts, geopolitical analysts, analysts in general, are patterns. Our brains are hardwired to, to figure out patterns and have narratives that just stay with us. Once you've figured out a pattern, think about if you've had a really good idea. You'll keep going back to that idea over and over again because your brain likes certainty. It likes to know that you did something right and that you understand the world. That gives you a sense of security. And the real challenge of doing the kind of analytical work that I do is that when you are presented with new variables, your entire old model has to go out the door. So. The fact that there are Russian peacekeepers in Donetsk and Luhansk, to a certain extent, if I'm being good with my method, I have to throw out my old prediction. I have to start from scratch and try to see the world completely new and not assume that I know anything, even though I've been studying this stuff and doing this analysis for decades. That's not a satisfying answer probably for your listeners, but what I would tell yeah. your li listeners is that um, we're in a completely new reality today. The old variables that I was working with are not necessarily the same variables. And what I'm looking for going forward, I think sort of the next thing to watch for is how serious is the West? How seriously are they going to take what Russia just did in Donetsk and Luhansk. If in Moscow, they view the West's response as weak, as showing that they really don't care, that they're not gonna hold Russia's feet to the fire if they go further, then a scenario where Russia can go further is a lot more likely, and that could be the direction that we're going in. Um, if, however, 
Russia has kind of done what it needs to do, and it's and it's really just angling for that political solution. And this is all going to be about dialing up pressure when it wants to, to get diplomatic and political accommodations that allow it to project political influence over Ukraine. Then kind of we're in that old scenario that I was talking about. So don't throw the baby out with the bathwater so much, but do recognize that here on Tuesday, we're in a completely different reality, and we kind of have to update all of our frameworks for what's going on. And when we get a new piece of information, whether it confirms or contradicts what I'm telling you, start again from scratch and try and say, okay, does this make sense? Do I understand something more about Putin than I didn't before? That's the hard work of, of doing geopolitics rather than just putting it in a headline and kind of going on your lunch break. Yeah, and if... Uh, tanks do roll down through Kiev and Russia does invade Ukraine. What are what do you think is the odds that oil remains below a hundred bucks? Oh, I think I think oil is going to a hundred no matter what. How I don't think it's staying under triple digits now. We're talking about whether it, it you know if it goes to a hundred dollars and one cent, you know that forecast is right. What we're really talking about here is whether whether oil has another. Um, price spike to jump. I would also tell listeners, because I think oil tends to get the lion's share of the conversation. Oil, honestly, is the one that I'm least worried about. Like, yes, oil, 100 a barrel, I think that's kind of already in the cards. I can definitely see scenarios where we go 120, you know, further than that. The 300 is, is one estimate I saw out there. That seems a little crazy to me. But yeah, over 100 for sure. And we're flirting with scenarios where 120, 130 is totally realistic. Um, but the things that people aren't talking about that worry me more are natural gas prices and coal prices. Uh, because coal, there's already a shortage, and a lot of countries still use coal right now. We saw this with the um, shortages and electricity brownouts in places like China uh, and India um, at the end of last year. Uh, natural gas, too. Uh, and natural gas is being driven by a lot of different things. Um, there's been a big drought in South America, so Br Brazil has been importing three times the level of LNG that it normally imports. Uh, Iran cut off natural gas exports to Turkey a couple weeks ago for 10 days without telling the Turks, and the t Turkish companies had to all shut down because they weren't getting power. Um, so it's really nat natural gas markets and coal markets are where I think you could see the real surge. Because one of the things that happens when oil prices go up is you start going towards you know, you, natural gas as a replacement. You start going towards coal as a replacement. And when those prices start going up, then you're in this never-ending doom loop of despair. Um, so you know, keep, an, keep an eye on oil prices. You can put $100 a barrel in the headline if you want. But um, I would really be focused on just how high natural gas and coal prices are going to go and how that's actually going to affect industrial production, supply chains, all these other sorts of things. And for something like coal, where there's really just not enough supply on the market, sky's the limit. I mean, we already had record prices last year. The IEA, even before all this, was projecting another year of record prices. And because there's been such levels of underinvestment in coal, because rightfully so, it's a dirty energy and that's not where people want to be in the future, you've got this kind of one to two year period where as coal gets phased out at the global level, um, it's hard to surge production. So I, I, coal is, is one of those areas where there's really just not enough supply to, to meet demand. Um, gas is a little bit different. It's not quite like oil where you can kind of see where the increase is going to come from. But we've, I mean, we've seen some of the recent spikes in Europe um, at the end of last year in the context of winter. Uh, I, I think that's a good framework for working with. Just take out cold winter and put in kind of some of the geopolitical forces we're talking about, and you might be able to see similar price levels. The saving grace, of course, and what makes this different, of course, is you expect that around winter. The thing is we might be getting, if some of these worst case scenarios come to fruition, you might be getting winter market fundamentals in these markets during the dead of summer. Um, and that I think would be the, the sort of price range that I would think about. And then if, if we're still having this conversation come next winter, uh, then suddenly we kind of have to reevaluate where we're going from here. So I, I won't give you an exact number, but I think um, coal, I, it's very hard to establish an upper limit to that just because of the supply demand imbalance. And natural gas, I think some of the recent price spikes give us an indication of just how high and how fast things can get if things don't go well. Yeah, it's not just about Russia and Ukraine. You note uh, in, in your most uh, recent report for cognitive investments that you, the common thread for your piece is the rising cost of energy. And you note that uh, you know, France is struggling with high electricity prices. Uh, people in Ghana are in the streets protesting over uh, the rising cost of fuel. The Brazil Brazilian election is focused on high fuel prices. Just talk about uh, rising energy prices as a global phenomenon. And you can sort of take your pick as to where you want to zoom in. 
Yeah, I think that's an important, I'm glad you brought that up. I think that's important because I think it's been lost in the general conversation about inflation. We're just all talking about inflation this, inflation that. And when you actually start to look at inf headline inflation figures, what's driving inflation is energy. If you were able to strip out energy prices, yes, you would have elevated inflation, but nothing like we're experiencing right now. I, th I can't remember what the exact figures were for Europe, but Europe's dealing with 20, 30% year on year increases in the price of energy. And that's true in a lot of countries throughout the world. The increase in energy prices is not related to the COVID-19 supply chain disruptions and the resurgence of demand, which is causing some of the inflation that we're looking at. The energy situation um, is, is really, um, it was happening right before COVID started. And we, we all forgot about it because we had understandably bigger things to deal with. But you might, I'll, I'll take your listeners back to the week or two weeks before lockdown. What was the big news? There was a Russia-Saudi price war over oil prices because Russia decided it wasn't going to listen to OPEC plus and it was going to pump as much as it wanted because they wanted to steal market share from the Saudis. As I've often said, in any other year, um, that would have been the biggest geopolitical story of the year. And unfortunately, 2020, we had a global pandemic just come and sweep it away. But as we get back to normal in the global economy, we're getting back to the sort of energy disruptions and issues we were already seeing unfold in the system in 2020. And I think kind of when you think about the next two to five years, it's a really difficult time period because the world is switching towards renewables and the cost of renewables is going down. But at least till 2024 or 2025, the growth in energy demand that we're seeing in the world is not going to be met by renewables. And you've had underinvestment in fossil fuels and in those typical sources. So we're in the middle of a paradigm shift and we have this disjuncture between kind of what people want and what is out there. Um, so I actually think, you know, towards the end of the decade, this is a completely different conversation. I don't think these high prices can remain elevated. I don't think this is any kind of long-term issue. Uh, but in the short term, in the sort of two to five year time horizon, as we are going towards renewables and hydrogen, and we're seeing these shortfalls between what fossil fuels are able to satisfy demand with and how renewables are going to be able to satisfy demand. We're going to have these difficult periods where we can see these big price spikes and where commodity speculators are going to have a really good time. We're living in pretty unprecedented times. We have a lot of different things happening. We have an energy transition that really, you know, we haven't seen an energy transition like this since the 1920s and 1930s when we rent, when we rent from coal to oil. It's, it's kind of that level of thing. We're going through an industrial revolution. So we've, we're going from the digital age to the age of automation and 5G and AI and all these other things. So that's a transformative thing. We're also going through a major geopolitical cycle where we're moving from globalization to more self-sufficiency and more regionalization and competition between rising and falling great powers, which means rebuilding supply chains, which also has inflationary impact as well. I think for me, the takeaway, um, and th this kind of this is one of the interesting places to think about geopolitics. I think geopolitics is more important to investing than it's been since before the Cold War, certainly. And that's because in that unipolar moment where the U.S. was the dominant global power, you saw that reflected in U.S. economic growth. You saw that reflected in U.S. equity performance. You saw that reflected in the fact that if you were long the U.S. over this time period, you did really well. Um, I think what's happening now with all of these transitions I'm not saying the U.S. is going to do badly. I think there are actually still a lot of interesting opportunities for the U.S., but I think that relative performance is going to shrink. I think when you're thinking about the opportunities out there in the world, you can no longer just you know, uh, throw a dart at the biggest countries by GDP and say, yeah, I'm going to throw my money into a China ETF and things are going to be great. Um, a tangible example, I wouldn't just throw my money at an India ETF and say, hey, they have a billion people, the demographics look good, they're going to grow really fast, it's going to be great. I wouldn't do that anymore. I think you have to be a lot more surgical about where you're going. So for instance, with India, I wouldn't go long all of India. I'd be looking at, okay, like India energy stocks, part of the inter India energy transition. That might be an interesting place to go down to. Indian agriculture, they're going to have to grow more food. There's going to be interesting things happening with Indian agriculture. So uh, it, it's more about being very specific about what sectors you want to be kind of exposed to globally. And then second, I think it's all, it's all we really are getting to a point where there's going to be more opportunities in the rest of the world. Some of the greatest opportunities are going to be in places like Brazil or like Turkey or like China and Japan, these countries that have these geopolitical issues that are making them act in certain ways and making them order their economies in certain ways and being able to soak up some, some of those opportunities. I do think it's worth pointing out that one of the reasons 
um, the world is in this situation is because after 2008, we had so many years of loose monetary policy. And in some sense, that is catching up with us. Um, you had that loose monetary policy for a long time, and then you had all the COVID-19 stimulus. So some of what we're seeing is in there. Um, and I, I think there's been this weird debate about is inflation transitory? Is it not all inflation is transitory. It's not the same today as it was tomorrow. It's kind of a, a red herring of an argument. I feel very confident that we're actually going to see deflationary forces towards the end of the decade. Um, in the short term, yeah, things can get kind of hairy. And the ener both the and we haven't even mentioned food. The energy energy is one problem. Food is another major problem. In some way, it's, it concerns me more than energy. And there are real tailwinds for both of those prices to go up kind of here in the next two to five years. What, what are those deflationary tailwinds that you said will start to uh, become relevant at the end of the decade? Oh, price of energy is going to go down. I mean, renewables are already yeah. really low. It's, it's about scaling renewables. Once you can scale renewables, once some of these technologies that we're talking about right now can actually not just meet demand growth, but start eating into demand itself, suddenly we're back. I mean, just remember where we were in 2019 and 2020. There was a glut of energy. And that was before we even had renewables. There was too much oil. There was too much natural gas. That's the long-term path. Like that's definitely happening. It's just about when exactly it's going to happen and positioning yourself accordingly. Um, for the next couple of years, I think there's actually a lot of great opportunities in oil and natural gas and coal, in part because of where folks' perceptions of fossil fuels went and how that related to investment and things like that. But the cost of energy is going to go down. Um, I also think, you know, we're talking about this geopolitical transition here. Um, as countries rebuild their supply chains and as they figure out how to navigate this changing supply chain environment, that's it's it's not a one-time investment, but once you kind of get through the first hurdle, things are going to start to get more efficient. Uh, you're not going to get these big log jams at ports, and you're not going to get all this competition for shipping and things like that. So all that's going to resolve itself too. And you know, knock on wood, there's not going to be any other COVID variant that shuts things down, and we can start to unwind some of the 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 inflationary forces that we saw that were tied to the pandemic. Um, the one that cuts against that is food. Um, I'm, I'm worried about food prices. I'm worried about food production. I'm worried about agricultural productivity, not being able to account for growing demand of food, and especially you know, places like Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, where the population is growing. Um, you know, I, I think you could see in those places rising food prices and attendant political instability. That would kind of be the counter. But the reason I say deflationary towards the end of the decade is just because I think the COVID stuff is going to unwind itself. We're going to see lower energy prices. And I do expect the supply chain issues uh, to go, not to go away, but to get less um, acute than they are right now. What is the one country that you see the best investment opportunities in right now? So the way I think about this is um, think about the world as it was before World War I, kind of the 1890s, where you had all these rising and falling great powers. Russia and China in the 1890s were falling apart. Japan, uh, the Ottoman Empire also was kind of on its last legs. Japan, though, was rising. Germany was rising. Britain was kind of uh, just where it was. The US went through a civil war and then was trying to get through its sort of thing. France was a disaster for a lot of different reasons we don't have to go into, but they also made some nice art and some nice music at the time. Um, it, it's a similar environment. In that environment, you wouldn't have wanted to have been exposed to any one country. You would have wanted to be um, well, it also, you'd have to time your movements really good, right? But you'd want to say, okay, I'll be long Japan, and I'll be long Germany, and I'll be short Russia, and I'll be short China and Turkey, and probably long the United States. Like you start mix and matching all those things to create an overall portfolio of returns. So that's what I would say. We really have to think of investment not as pick one country that's going to outperform. Think of the global opportunities, both long and short, that you're going to be able to capitalize on because of all the forces that we've talked about here today. Sure. But if you are going long sum and short the other, that sort of implies that there is a difference in terms of expected returns. So what would the countries be where you would have the highest countries, not one country? Where would some of, some of the countries be where you would expect the highest returns? And let's say absolute return, not volatility adjusted. You know, you can sort of stomach the volatility. And if we want to go the other side, uh, what are the worst where maybe you would go short because you said long and short? Sure. Uh, I mean, you can kind of tell from some of the things that I said. I think Brazil is really, really interesting. 
Uh, Brazil's kind of been in the doldrums for a while now. They're probably going to get Lula back as a president. Just look at what happened to Brazil the last time Lula was president. They have a lot of the commodities that people need. Uh, in general, I'm very bullish about Latin America, um, in part because I think U.S. supply chains are not all going to be able to just come home and reshore to the United States. They're going to nearshore, near shore, and that means good things for places like Chile, like Mexico, like Brazil. Um, you know, that's going to be the American sphere of influence. Um, I'm very interested in Turkey and Iran. Those are both Middle Eastern powers that I think are on the rise, especially as Iran kind of comes back into the normal economic world. Uh, I would be less, I would be very, very skeptical of some of the Arab states like Saudi Arabia and Egypt and Algeria, just because of the food security issues they have and because they don't have the demographic or industrial profiles of countries that I think are well suited to this time period. Um, I think the European Union is incredibly interesting. I'm bullish on the European Union from a geopolitical level, and I think that creates interesting opportunities within the EU. You have to watch really closely, though, because there's a lot of countercurrents there. Uh, Russia, you know, we've talked about Russia and Ukraine. Russia is clearly a country in decline. Demographically, it's a disaster. Uh, they don't have a self-sufficient industrial base, no matter what Putin wants to say. I think a lot of what we're seeing with Russia is they recognize that their strength is decreasing with each day. So they're kind of lashing out all over the place. And in general, Russia is always going to behave in favor of its national security interests rather than its economic growth profile. I think Russia is less powerful today than it is 20 years. It's more aggressive. It's asserting itself yeah. more. But the reason it's doing that is because it is weakening. The long-term trends for Russia are bad. The demographic profile is bad. Um, it's economic. It, the diversification of its industrial base is bad. It doesn't have any of the cutting edge technologies that are going to power the fourth industrial revolution. I mean, it's just not a pretty picture um, when you look at where Russia is going from that perspective. In some ways, Russia's basically becoming the, the provider of Chinese energy. That That's the path that they're on right now if they continue going down this route. That's why I say like Putin can have his day in the sun right now, but if, if he's really going to go after Ukraine, he's going to fail. It's going to be bad for Russia kind of in the long term. Um, and and then, uh, the other one before we complete our tour of the world, uh, you know, India is really in is really complicated. In some ways, India is really not one country. It's a bunch of different countries smushed together. So the thing I always say about India is just be really careful where you are in India. I think there are going to be some areas in which India could do extremely well. Um, there'll be other areas where India, because of a lack of government execution or just because of how unruly it is, that they're not going to do well at all. Um, they've known for decades the infrastructure and changes and reforms they need to make to do well. They haven't done them and not even Modi has been able to do them. So I would caution, I think people either take kind of a black or white view on India. I'm very... You know, let's roll up our sleeves and see the individual investment rather than try and think at the macro level with India, because that's that's very hard. So, um, you know, those are just a few. But if you, uh, you know, I would also say if you're looking for that kind of thing, you know, just look where growth is going to happen. Um, population growth is happening in sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, Latin America. That's also the places where some of these more powerful countries are going to try and sell their goods and are going to harvest commodities and things like that. You can see what happens in those boom bust cycles when we get to those major transitions and the countries you want to be exposed to in some ways are the ones that have commodities like a chile or a brazil but also have the chance of moving up the value chain and having their own industrial supply chains and not being so dependent on the commodities boom bust cycle that's the profile of the type of country i'm looking i'm looking for what about china long-term growth potential as well as geopolitical risks as and specifically uh, uh, problems in the financial plumbing, namely, you know, uh, debt, uh, uh, debt that's on the private sector um, and, and stuff like that. Well, the first thing I say about China is uh, don't underestimate them. People have been underestimating China for decades now, and anybody who has underestimated them has, do has done very poorly. Um, at a geopolitical level, um, if we think in terms of the Chinese Communist Party as a Chinese dynasty, it's still very early on in its rule. Most Chinese dynasties that achieve the kind of power the Communist Party has rule for hundreds of years. I'll also say that if you look back at China's history, and I like China because we have thousands of years of history to compare to and understand what's going on, um, usually the central government starts to lose control before things go badly. And that's not what's happening in China right now. If anything, the central government is increasing its control. And it's not facing those kind of serious challenges to what's going on. Um, so I think China's in a really difficult spot for the next five to 10 years. Um, its economy has been fueled by debt, as you rightly pointed out. Its economy has basically been a Ponzi scheme where they just keep sweeping the debt underneath the rug and reorganizing and kind of moving forward. 
and the interesting stuff that's been happening in China in just the last year or two, and it's around this real estate development crisis, is that they've. it seems like they're trying to break the wheel. Um, they're not bailing out the real estate developers. They're saying, no, you engaged in rampant speculation that we didn't condone. You went a- around our rules. We're not going to bail you out. We're actually going to use state-owned enterprises to buy up this property super cheap so the, the government itself can do better. Um, that's going to be really messy. For instance, like just this week, I was looking at reports of, you know, in local governments and in the interior of China of them not being able to pay civil servants. Um, That's bad. Um, If you get that kind of level of social instability in China, things could go really, really badly. So I I personally, I think China long term is extremely interesting and I don't underestimate them. I think they'll get where they need to go. Um, But right now, I think we're going through a period of intense adjustment. And I can argue the pro case and the con case china you know with with kind of equal passion um i'm i'm more on the pro case but the the threats are very real you could i I could very easily spin everything i just told you and say yeah the the ponzi scheme bill is coming due and there's no way the china chinese communist party can keep this house of cards going and they're going to struggle to even make it to the end of the decade um the main variable to watch there is what happens to xi jinping because he hasn't announced a successor and if he got hit by a bus tomorrow the whole thing kind of collapses because he's concentrated a lot of power within himself. So I'm looking for who is the successor? When are they naming the successor? Do we have some kind of roadmap to a political transition post Xi? That would be a sign to be really positive about China. Uh, if we don't see that, if it's all Xi, and if we start seeing signs of you know civil servants not being paid and people getting upset because they had too much of their investments in real estate and protesting in the streets, then we're in a very different sort of scenario and China, the Chinese government might be able to, or might be losing its grip. So I don't have an easy answer for you with China, but gun to my head, I, I, I don't underestimate China. I think they can get through it, even though it's going to be difficult here over the 2020s. Mm. Uh, Jacob, it's been great having you on uh, my podcast. Is, is there any closing words that you'd like to leave uh, my audience with? And in particular, maybe it's some some advice, people who are not used to geopolitical analysis. What are, you, what are some common mistakes that people make when they're when they are sort of making the uh, geopolitical analysis and how could people avoid them? Well, the self-serving thing for me to say is, uh, you know, you should be reading me all the time and talking to me all the time, whether it's, you know, <laughs> at, at CI or like Eon or, or at Perch. But the, um, seriously, though, it doesn't matter whether it's me or, or someone else. Um, don't ignore geopolitics and don't assume geopolitics is simple. Um, make sure that you have someone who is thinking about geopolitics with you. And then second, um, don't believe anything you read. Um Always, you know, I, I, no, I'm, I'm serious. Like, don't believe anything you read. Check the sources for everything. Let's say you see an article in Western Press that is about some report that somebody published that says, I don't know, the world's going to end due to climate change. S- stop reading. Get the citation. Go find the report. Read it yourself. Like, trust me, you're all more intelligent than you think you are. You'll actually learn a lot of different things when you start looking at where media articles are sourcing things, whether it's government documents or NGOs or think tank documents, things like that. Um, In some ways, the types of the job that I do is very unsexy. It's just about reading constantly. It's about understanding what's real and being able to parse, you know, the 2% of the signal from the 98% of noise. So you can outsource that to an expert like me. You can do it yourself. But my, my key takeaway for people is just understand that the media environment right now, we're in, we're in an environment where there's more information than ever before. And that's actually, it's actually a really big challenge then to find what's real and what's important. So make sure that you are going through that exercise and doing that and not just taking things at face value. Um, and whether that's because you, you know, read about geopolitics or you have people on your team that are doing that who are constantly keeping you on your heels, um, there's a lot of different ways to do it. But just just don't get comfortable because the world's not going to be a comfortable place here for the next 10 to 20 years. That's good advice. Uh, Jacob, thank you so much for coming on Forward Guidance. Thank you, everyone, for watching. You can uh, definitely check out more of Jacob's work uh, at Jacob Schapp on, on Twitter. Uh, thanks so much. Thanks, Jack. Good to be with you.